Thank you, Captain. Uh, it's really a delight for me to host this very last panel, and let me uh, congratulate Captain Sherlock and, and the other organizers of the conference. It's been a uh, terrific conference, and I have no doubt that this uh, last panel will, uh, will, I don't know if we save the best for last, but um, I think, I think we'll, we'll be impressed. Um, undoubtedly, uh, the Commandant and um, my friend Dr. Economy has uh, set us up for a very um, important discussion about the Indo-Pacific region and, the, and other uh, major issues such as cyber in the strategic environment. Um, we are all aware that the uh, signs of rivalry across the uh, Pacific area are, 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 are extant. Um, we, many of us, including myself, but many others here at the college are following the uh, set up of new bases, the, the massive, unprecedented, really, reclamation efforts by China and the South China Sea, of course. Um, but uh, don't forget about the dangerous intercepts that have occurred just over the last couple of months. Uh, it's not a new pattern, but it, it's very troubling. And I believe uh, just within the last week, we had uh, Chinese Navy ships for the first time, uh, complemented, it seems, by, by Russian Navy ships in uh, in and around uh, the contested islets, the, the Sinkaku Diaoyu uh, islets in the East China Sea. So the signs of growing rivalry are there. Um, uh, I would just say, though, for my part, though, it's also important to keep in mind on the other side of the ledger that um, there are, uh, we don't want to forget that um, as we look out across the Asia Pacific that we're now uh, coming up now on almost four decades in which there has not really been a major interstate war in that region. And that's, that's really quite remarkable and uh, also, I think, worth reflecting on. Another uh, positive sign, if I, I always like to bring some good news, if you go on the website of the State Department, you'll see a report out of the 8th Strategic and Economic Dialogue. Perhaps Tom's going to talk about this some more, but uh, it's really pretty amazing how much uh, cooperation there is ongoing between Beijing and Washington as well. So uh, in areas you wouldn't necessarily imagine, uh, um, for instance, the Arctic and the Antarctic. So anyway, we want to take a, take a balanced view. Uh, but coming back to um, uh, one of my several mentors here that spoke yesterday, uh, my professor Andy Krepinevich, there he is, um, who, who uh, brought up the issue of scissors and paper. Well, we won't touch on that, but he, he implored us to focus on Westpac, Westpac, Westpac. He, uh, he mentioned the size of China's economy the, and uh, possibly the lack of strategic depth. He asked the provocative question of why, you know, what is it about this pivot? What is the reason for it? Can we, we have to uh, make sure we understand it better. Um, so I think all of our panelists are extremely well position to discuss these issues and many others, um, and I'm looking forward to all these great presentations. Let's start with uh, Dr. Michael Green. He's the Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Chair in Modern and Contemporary Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Thank you, Lyle. Am I on? Um, thank you. Yeah. Now I'm on. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Lyle, and I'm very, very happy to come back to the War College every, every chance I get. Um, I thought that I would try to capture the dynamics uh, of international relations in the Indo-Pacific in a very Chinese way, even though I'm trained as a Japan scholar. Um, the Japanese often have these four character phrases, uh, rich nation, strong army, revere the emperor, expel the barbarian. Uh, China's are longer and more convoluted, but I thought it would be a, a good way to try to um, slice and dice the um, contradictory security dynamics we see. So uh, let me spend the next few minutes describing for you the three contradictions and the three will nots of um, the Indo-Pacific's emerging regional order. The first contradiction, uh, Chinese leaders um, believe that the so-called peaceful rise of China, um, what uh, Hu Jintao um, downgraded to the peaceful development of China, but uh, Xi Jinping has cranked up again to um, what he calls a 
concept of an order of, uh, of agents for agents, that this, this idea that the natural default position of, of, of the Asia region is Sinocentric and that it's good for everyone, um, uh, uh, this, this is a pretty powerful um, narrative um, and assumption for many Chinese uh, leaders in Zhenanghai. Um, uh, the corollary is that only the United States is in a position to block or hinder that natural uh, return to a Sinocentric system. And the contradiction is that the more China tries through counter-intervention strategies within the First Island chain, coercion strategies against smaller uh, maritime states in the region, the more it does that, the more these states then align with the United States and align with each other and ultimately provide precisely the kind of obstacle to a Sinocentric system that uh, that is supposed to be so natural. And this network um, is uh, quite obvious. The U.S.-Japan alliance now with the Defense Guidelines Review and Mr. Abe's new security legislation is essentially an alliance that's in the process of becoming more joint and combined, um, having not been so for almost its entire history. The U.S., Japan, and India, Japan and India are doing more together. <clears throat> um, Myanmar's opening was largely about uh, uh, Chinese pressure. Um, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement with the Philippines, which I think even with the new Philippine President, Mr. Duterte, sometimes called the Donald Trump of Manila, um, uh, uh, is going to continue and strengthen. I think um, Duterte's team is actually um, uh, quite, uh, quite good. <clears throat> and Korea, which has been very, very, very careful about China, um, angered at China's um, unwillingness uh, or perhaps inability to control North Korea um, has agreed uh, to discuss introducing theater high uh, uh, area alt high altitude area defense THAAD, which the Chinese explicitly made a condition of uh, Korea-China relations. The second contradiction is that in spite of all of this counterbalancing and alignment, um, China has not been deterred from its uh, course in the South China Sea, uh, and the United States is not really in a position to uh, formulate some kind of collective security arrangement uh, in the region as China rises. Because for every example of a state in the region aligning more closely with the US or with India or Australia or Japan, um, the Chinese side can point to another example of a defection uh, from this um, alignment. Um, the Koreans in 2005 uh, were asked by the Department of Defense to agree to strategic flexibility um, allowing the U.S. to have more use of our forces on the peninsula for contingencies in Asia, um, which obviously included Taiwan and, and, and possible confrontations with China. Um, the Koreans at the time, the government said no. They leaked it. And from a Chinese perspective, I was, a, I was running the Asia part of the National Security Council at the time. Um, from the Chinese perspective, it was a defection. It was a clear case of China's influence and the weakness of American alliances. We asked for too much. <clears throat> um, Abe's uh, proposal in 2007 for a US, Japan, Australia, India quad, quite a powerful um, uh, a symbol of the major maritime democracies coming together, was essentially rejected by the other three countries. Um, another example for China. Vietnam, which is hyper real politique, and the president just had a good trip to Vietnam and strengthened defense cooperation, but Vietnam is constantly recalibrating to ensure that it's um, restoring good relations with the uh, fellow socialist uh, state <clears throat> um, and party to party ties after it has restored some balance of power. And even Britain, our special, our special uh, partner, our special ally, uh, has surprised the United States um, with various moves, including a decision to join China's uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank that, that surprised Washington. The third contradiction um, is that even as uh, US-China competition becomes more intense and frankly more dangerous uh, within East Asia and in the Western Pacific, uh, US-China cooperation on global issues is generally moving in a good direction. Uh, as Liz Economy mentioned, cooperation on Iran, on Ebola, the financial crisis, on climate change, these big global issues, we seem to be finding ways bit by bit to cooperate better with China. The administration is, or initially was, wrong uh, to assume that cooperation on these global issues would be the remedy for the tension and regional issues. This was a clear statement in the national security strategy in the early 
um, uh, documents and thinking of the administration. It doesn't work quite like that. Um, but China's doing what rising powers do, including the United States. Uh, rising powers, the US in the 19th century, uh, Bismarck's Germany, <coughs> Japan in the first part of the 20th century, generally free ride on the global power, Britain or the United States, we proudly did that, while engaging in revisionist behavior in their own hemisphere, in their own region, which of course we did, uh, Bismarck did, and the Japanese did. Um, so uh, there is this contradiction, and uh, it will continue. The interesting question is whether um, uh, there's a tipping point at which the uh, competition in Asia gets in the way of cooperation on global issues. I don't think we're near that. We could create that. We could start cutting deals. It would be a big mistake, but I don't think we're near that. And I think China's ability to manage these contra that particular contradiction is captured in um, the six-character phrase Xi Jinping has been uh, advancing, the, the uh, Xinjiang Daguo Guanxi, the new model of great power relations, um, which essentially um, is an agreement to cooperate with the U.S. and avoid conflict. Um, as it's been to explain to me, um, in Beijing, uh, not challenging the U.S. globally, but expecting the United States to recognize that China is a dogwo, a great power in Asia, the only great power in Asia. So a bipolar uh, arrangement in Asia, where we accede to certain spheres of influence, but the U.S. remains the leading power. All right, the three will nots. Um, China will not write the rules. In this competition for influence and leadership in Asia, it is often said China is going to write the rules. Uh, President Obama, in order to sell the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, has found that this resonates with Congress. <clears throat> if we don't pass TPP, China is going to write the rules. <clears throat> um, the, uh, uh, the President of China, Xi Jinping, as you heard from Liz, has stated China is going to start writing the rules. <clears throat> um, I went to college with Watterson, the, the, the cartoonist who does Calvin and Hobbes. He had this great cartoon where Calvin is about seven years old and he goes and tells his dad, I've decided to grow his beard. And his dad keeps reading the newspaper and says, all right, that's fine. And Calvin's very surprised. Um, China's not ready to write the rules. Um, the, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank um, has problems, no doubt about it. But the governor of that bank is cooperating with the Asia Development Bank with the World Bank um, to try to find best practices, in part because China's discovering what's called the moral hazard. You don't want to be the last lender of resort and have and be the only holder of debt for all these massive projects in unstable parts of the world. <clears throat> um, the One Belt, One Road, I learned yesterday from an expert who spoke at our institution, it's now called OBOR, Belt and Road, One Belt and Road. Tom will tell us what it, what it should be called. <clears throat> um, I've looked into this, Tommy should comment on this, but as far as I can tell, there's a lot of uh, money talked about, there's a lot of um, promises, there's no governing structure. No one can tell me or anyone I know how bids will be made, how accountability will be handled. RCEP, the alternate free trade discussion that the United States is not in, the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, um, uh, which supposedly will dominate the region um, if we don't do TPP. Well, not so fast. Yes, China's the biggest economy in it, but Australia's in it, Japan's in it, New Zealand's in it. These are not countries that are going to roll over and, and agree to a, a trading system in Asia that's uh, protectionist. Uh, and more importantly, with all respect to uh, our friends in India, India's in it. And if you want to be sure that a multilateral trade agreement goes nowhere fast, invite India. <laughs> so on the institutional side, I do not think China's going to um, write the rules anytime soon, anytime soon. And in terms of norms, or the so-called Beijing consensus, um, uh, after Tom and I escaped from the Bush administration, there was this wonderful, wonderful survey done by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs on soft power. And one of the questions it was done in Asia. And one of the questions is, what country's soft power increased the most over the last decade? And this is in 2008. And the answer in every country was, and they expected China, but the answer in every country was, and remember, this is the Bush administration. You can see why Tom and I liked it. The answer in every country was the U.S. soft power increased the most over the last 10 years, except in the U.S., where Americans said, oh, no, no, China's soft power increased the most in the 10 years. Um, 
We've done surveys at CSIS of uh, elites where um, we ask what should the norms be that drive the new model, excuse me, the um, integration of Asia, so-called East Asia community, if Asia moves in the direction of greater integration like Europe or North America. <clears throat> Economic cooperation is number one. Avoiding conflicts, number two. And then the list starts getting populated with things like free and fair elections, good governance, um, law and order, uh, excuse me, um, uh, uh, rule of law, <clears throat> um, women's empowerment. Um, uh, the outlier is China, not the United States. So uh, China's in a very strong position to contest these norms and institutions, to hedge, to develop their own, but I don't think to write the rules. <clears throat> um, second, um, will not. Um, we are in a, a, a dangerous dynamic in, in the South China Sea as, and, and in the Western Pacific, as Lyle described. But I think we will not reach an equilibrium um, until the United States demonstrates more willpower than we have. Um, that China has much more successfully demonstrated to the region uh, its risk tolerance. And what we've generally signals, signaled is an intolerance for risk. Um, and that affects um, this gray zone, uh, as we Asianists like to say, little blue men, um, uh, contest of will, of coercion, um, and of whether or not you can change the status quo. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, we um, are in a situation where all the counterbalancing and all of the concern about China that's been expressed is clearly not enough um, to arrest uh, uh, what we're seeing in terms of course of activity, and it's going to take, and we should be ready for, uh, a bit more risk in our policy, in my view. And the third and last uh, will not. Um, it, the United States needs a strategy, as one of the questioners asked earlier, a national strategy, or a grand strategy, if you will. Um, but the United States will not develop a national strategy or a grand strategy for this problem set <coughs> unless we have a, a naval strategy. And I'm not just saying that because I'm at the Naval War College and I want free stuff from the booth out front. Um, I'll pay for the free stuff. Um, I'm saying it because um, I, I just finished a book. It's coming out soon, and I wanted to plug it. Um, on the, <laughs> don't, don't buy that book. That's $7 on Amazon. Wait a few months, buy the new book. It'll be $49. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it will have maps and pictures. <clears throat> um, but in this, in this uh, 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 seven-year uh, study I did of, of the evolution of American grand strategic thinking in Asia since 1782, when this first came up with Thomas Jefferson. Got it. Um, uh, what was very clear was um, that our grand strategies usually started with the U.S. Navy, occasionally the Army, but almost always with the U.S. Navy. And Mahan, of course, is a great example of that. I mean, uh, Mahan is fascinating not only because of the decisive battle and his strategic concepts for employment of the Navy. He was a big thinker. He talked about trade. He talked about values. He talked about the geopolitics of Asia, the problem of Asia. <coughs> it, it, uh, Perry, after opening Japan, did it before him. And Porter of the Essex did it in 1815 and 16. <coughs> um, the, the Navy hasn't always done that well. Uh, War Plan Orange uh, is an example of uh, sophisticated development of a naval strategy, but poor grand strategy. Um, the planners were told in 1908 by the Navy Board, don't talk about balance of power, don't talk about alliances, don't talk about trade, solve the military problem. The first president briefed on War Plan Orange was Theodore Roosevelt. No president was briefed until Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in the 20s and 30s, the military and the naval strategy um, diverted from the Treasury Department strategy, the State Department strategy. Um, better example, Tom Hayward um, and the maritime strategy, which did not have a national strategy to support it when he started doing it in the late 70s to deal with the Soviet problem of counter, of uh, horizontal escalation. Um, but it became the kernel of um, uh, a grand strategy um, developed by the Reagan White House um, in the 80s. So I think there's um, a lot of value in thinking about these problems big uh, in a place like the War College. Thanks. Excuse me, now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Emily Goldman. She's Director of U.S. Cyber Command, National Security Agency Combined Action Group. And her book, Power in Uncertain Times, Strategy in the Fog of Peace, was published by Stanford in 2011. The floor is yours, Dr. Goldman. Uh, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back here at the War College. I spent 
let's see, 91, 92 here um, teaching, and it really is a, it's a tremendous institution. Um, I want to be clear that I'm here in my official capacity, but my remarks are my opinions only, and they don't reflect the official position of U.S. Cyber Command, the Department of Defense, or any other U.S. government agency. Um, <laughs> Can you, can you square that circle? Well, it's an academic, we have a little more flexibility in an academic environment. Okay, so um, I wanna start off by you know, just reiterating, I, I think this is a terrific topic for this forum, strategy in uncertain times. Um, in my book, I talked a lot about what complexity is. Um, and I think it really can be boiled down to um, the number of threats, the diversity of threats, and interdependence. And I want to focus on the notion of interdependence, because what I would argue today is that the cyberspace domain has dramatically increased interdependence and connectivity, and thus complexity. Um, and it's, it's introduced um, a lot of complexity into the battlefield. And what you have is countries around the world, states and non-state actors, playing with it, experimenting with it, trying to integrate it into their broader military and national strategies. And they're doing it in different ways, and therefore it becomes very different to get, get an assessment on what their capabilities are. Um, but I think it's very important because it touches everything that we do. And I would argue that no one today can, ex can exert or maintain national power without an acute sensitivity to the digital networks that underlay our communications, our prosperity, and our security. Um, let's start first by talking about what our adversaries are doing. Um, it, it's pretty clear that U.S. adversaries um, are investing heavily in cyber. They're investing in this as an asymmetric means to counter traditional U.S. strengths. They're preparing the cyber battlefield now by stealing intellectual property, conducting industrial espionage. They're exploiting government networks, financial system networks, communication industry networks. Um, through intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, they are establishing, they're, they're gaining penetration into our systems, and they're establishing persistent access. Um, and our senior um, intelligence agency officials have spoken about this in open testimony before Congress. Um, we also know that they're increasingly intent on targeting U.S. industrial control or SCADA systems. So what I would argue they're doing is that they're positioning themselves now in a pre-conflict period. They're integrating cyber in a holistic manner into their strategies far more effectively than the United States is doing. People talk about Russia's hybrid warfare strategy, China's informationalized warfare, or salami slicing tactics. Um, they're thinking about this in a very different way um, than the U.S. is. And what they're doing, I would argue, is using cyberspace operations in peacetime to violate our sovereignty. Um, putting malware in our critical infrastructure, attacking our industry, but keeping the activity just below the level that might trigger violence. Um, I think it's um, senior defense officials have said that this is probably the one place where the U.S. does have peer competitors. Yet, we're self-constrained from responding, and so I want to ask why. Why do we have that condition in the U.S. today? Because I think it really goes fundamentally to um, our, conce our concepts for thinking about, about strategy in this, in this space. Um, several challenges that the U.S. faces. The first one is that we adhere to an intellectual binary construct that we're either at peace or we're at war. Peace is the norm, war is an aberration. And what this does is this constrains us intellectually for thinking about how to counter adversary activity in what we call phase zero. So I would argue that we're in an era of persistent confrontation just short of violence. Our adversaries understand this. They are operating in phase zero in, in the cyberspace domain. They're positioning themselves, they're conducting military operations and we are not responding, okay? Because our leaders will say, well, did this cross the threshold hold of war? Was this an attack? Well, if not, then, then, you know, then it, often it becomes sort of a law enforcement or a criminal issue. So what I would argue, first of all, is we need to think about what it means to win in phase zero, because that's where 
the fight is going on now. We may not be involved in a kinetic flight, fight, but I would argue in cyberspace we are at war. We're maneuvering with adversaries every day um, on, the, on the borders of our networks. So that's the first challenge we face. Um, the second one is that our strategy is based on geography, and we also think about strategy differently in foreign space and in domestic space. And what that means is that we are not bureaucratically organized to respond to malicious cyberspace activity um, because our, our responses are typically um, defined by what the source of intrusion is, intend, is, is defined to be. So is it a military problem? Is it a, you know, a criminal problem? Is it a homeland security problem? But cyberspace cuts across those bureaucratic jurisdictions, okay? It doesn't recognize geography. It doesn't recognize foreign and domestic space. It engages multiple authorities of our intelligence community, of our state and local governments, of our federal government. Um, and the bottom line is because all these authorities are engaged and we're not streamlined to deal with this, um, we're not fast, we're not agile, and we have a difficult time innovating. So, you know, in, in some cases, um, you know, we have a hard time thinking about that we need to be able to, to, to maneuver our cyberspace forces globally because when someone says, well, look, you can do cyber operations in an area of hostility like Iraq because we're, you know, we're at war. But the question is, well, what does that mean? Because our adversaries are operating off of our infrastructure. They're operating off of allied infrastructure. They're not confined to a geographic space. So when you, when you step back and look at it, what you see, you know, we're at the War College talking about warfare. It's now possible to do one of the things that warfare was always one of the, the goals of warfare, to plunder. You can plunder another nation without ever stepping on their territory. So, so what does that mean when we think about are we at war or are we, are we not? Um, a third challenge that we, we face is that we treat cyberspace operations as something special and something unique. We don't treat it yet as a traditional military activity. So we distinguish cyberspace operations from information warfare. Um, part of, I think there's two reasons why we treat it as special. The first one is because cyber is so deeply entwined with signals intelligence in the United States. Okay, cyberspace is the primary platform for conducting signals intelligence operations. And there is a whole culture and set of processes and procedures that get carried along with that. Um, and what that means sort of in the clearest sense is that often when you're evaluating whether you're going to do a cyberspace operation, the intelligence community's concern for intelligence gain and loss will outweigh the military's concern for operational effectiveness. Okay, so you constantly have this challenge um, to deal with. So first of all, in the U.S., this, this tie, this closeness with SIGINT makes it difficult. You know, cyber becomes different. The second um, thing that's happened is that we've, you know, cyber has been sort of associated with the nuclear era. People talk about, you know, cyber as if it's something special and distinct. I mean, we talk about deterrence talk about escalation. We've already adopted much of the intellectual um, arsenal that emerged in the nuclear era. And so for all these reasons, we treat cyber as something special and unique. Our adversaries treat cyber as just another way to go about achieving their security interests, achieving their goals, achieving their objectives. Um, so what are the consequences of this? Um, I'll briefly tick off the consequences and then some of the things I think we can do to, to address them. Or what I should say, what you all need to do to address them once you leave here um, and, and go to your next stations. Um, first of all, I, I'd argue that we've self-limited ourselves in this domain. We separate cyber from other aspects of national power. We don't integrate it well into broader military operations. Um, I'd argue that while our adversaries have mainstreamed cyber, we've often ghettoized cyber. We have an unwieldy approval process in order to execute our operations. This is not anything unique. I mean, we're very familiar with engaging in an interagency process, particularly in the global war on terror, um, before we execute operations. But you would be amazed at the number of, of decisions that have to go all the way up to the Secretary of Defense or to the President. Um, and this makes it very, very difficult to be agile when the, the infrastructure and the tactics and techniques and procedures of your adversary are adapting so quickly. So the approval process is way too long. Um, our adversaries, on the other hand, are relatively uninhibited about how they use cyber. They use criminal elements. They use private patriotic hackers. They use cyber militia. 
Um, so they're, they're far more unconstrained than we are. And if you look at a case, so I'll, my China example, since I am planted right here in the middle of the China panel, um, <laughs> Give you a little, your little cyber detour here. Um, cyber is deeply integrated into China's larger economic and national policy. Um, their economy has been driven a large degree by IP, IP theft, and it's not just from the U.S., it's from many other countries as well. And that's really a symptom of their larger economic and national strategy. It's not unique to cyber, but it's been very effectively integrated. So what do we need to do? Um, some ideas to think about in terms of addressing these issues. First of all, institutions. Okay, I think first of all we need a way to coordinate short of war policies, strategies, and operations. Okay, so short of war that are too big for DOD. They involve the authorities of other U.S. government entities and the private sector. So we need to figure out a way to coordinate that. We need to nest cyber operations in our broader strategy. And we need to develop the collaborative partnerships at the operational level so we can work with our interagency partners, our coalition partners, um, and the private sector. Because we need to be exercising and working with them now because, as my boss often says, discovery learning is very, very painful in a crisis. You want to know who you're, you're operating with. So those partnerships are, are critical. Secondly, um, policy. I would argue that the U.S. government has not yet reached a consensus on what the role of the military should be in cyberspace. Okay, military should defend Department of Defense information networks, so you're protecting your own networks, right? In, in, in a, an attack of significant strategic consequence, the U.S. military is supposed to help um, defend the nation. But there's a lot of things that kind of fall in between that, and there really is not a consensus about wh what role the military should play. Um, finally, um, strategy, so it's a good place to, to, to end up. I would argue that with the proliferation of cyber and other capabilities across the globe, that there's a diminishing marginal utility in investing in technology over strategy. Okay, everyone's got the stuff. We have to figure out how we're going to use it, how we're going to leverage it um, within our political system in a way that protects the privacy and civil liberties of, of U.S. persons. Um, but nonetheless, we have to decide what we want to achieve in this era of great power conflict. Um, do we want to win or do we just want to survive? Um, I would argue that there's an ideological conflict underway because we want to guarantee an open and a free internet um, and our adversaries, China, Iran, you know, other authoritarian states, they do not want that. Um, so we need to figure out what we want, um, what we're willing to do to secure it, and I would argue that that's going to require a level of consensus and a level of interagency cooperation that probably um, comes to the level of what we had to achieve during the Cold War. So on that less than optimistic note, I will stop. Okay, thank you so much. Here finally from uh, Dr. Ross Babbage. He's uh, Chief Executive Officer of Strategic Forum Limited, a, a not-for-profit organization committed to fostering high-level discussions and debates on the primary security challenges confronting Australia and its close allies. And he's, he's recently written a, a case for a new Australian grand strategy as well. So, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say it is an enormous privilege and uh, pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I, what I'm going to do actually now, in, in, attempt to do in about 10 or 15 minutes, is, is something which is really rather different to my panelists, although it builds pretty directly on and ask very clearly uh, a major but I think really important question. How should the close allies of the United States in the Western Pacific um, how should they operate? What should their strategy be, given the changing strategic circumstances we're now fa facing? What really should we be doing, and what should be uh, the guidance? Uh, so let me just go forward, if I can. No, let's try that. So two very particular questions. What is the best security strategy for a close ally? And what practical steps should such allies such as Australia, uh, consider doing. And I'm going to give you a very, uh, you know, take Australia, if you like, as a case study, and I'm going to rip through a whole lot of uh, slides and just give you a bit of the flavour of some of the things that have been on our minds as we're looking at these issues in the last couple of years in particular. Firstly, just a, a very quick reminder. Australia is a very big place. Um, in fact, um, the, continent, uh, the continental landmass of, of Australia is about the same size as the continental landmass of the United States. 
Uh, in fact, if you go out in the Indian Ocean from the Cocos Islands through to the Great Barrier Reef, it's over 5,000 kilometres. That's further than the distance across the North Atlantic. We have serious security problems. But we have a population about the same size as Texas. How many Texans have we got here? We've got a few. Well, I'm going to encourage everyone here to think as though they're a Texan for a minute. But you're a Texan on a continent the size of continental US, and that's all. There's only about 24 million of you, and that's it. With an economy we have about the same as Texas in terms of GDP, with a living standard about the same, and with a very strong resource base. We have, we are, we and Indonesia are the two largest coal exporters in the world. Uh, in uh, two years' time, we'll, we will be, Australia will be the largest LNG exporter. We are by far the largest iron ore exporter. Uh, we have 40% of the world's uranium, uh, proven uranium supplies, and a whole raft of other things. We also have some very advanced industries, uh, very high tech in a range of areas. So we're in a very unusual situation. And what's more, we're in a, a rather str strange part of the world. So imagine, here you are as Texans, if you like, on a continent that size, just sitting off Asia. What should your strategy be? Especially what should your strategy be when the security situation is changing pretty fundamentally in a range of ways. Let me just quickly run through 12 of the key drivers that we've been focusing on. There are others. But, and I'm not going to go through all this in detail. We all know uh, the changing power relativities is a consequence of the rapid growth in China's economy. China is actually Australia's largest trading partner, um, but it's almost all in commodities. Uh, and there's not a lot of involvement in other ways. In fact, in terms of investment, they're only number six uh, in Australia. Um, in fact, some have said, and I think it's a fair point, uh, that the, the economic relationship is really an arm's length economic relationship. There's not a lot of trust, to be frank, um, as there is, for instance, in stark contrast uh, with our close allies and with countries like Japan. We're worried and we think a lot about the nature of the regime in China and, and its behavior, and uh, like the United States does, and, and what that means not only for what we see now, but what might we be seeing in 10 to 20 years' time, and as we all know in this room, the time frame for national security investment is long, and we have to be thinking forward. Um, China's surging military power, I could go into this in great detail, there's about 10 major elements of that that we've focused intensely on because they're the ones that worry us most, um, but I'm not going to go through that today in great detail. What I'm simply going to say is, on the top of it, if you like, in conflict, our assessment is, um, in, a, in a period of conflict, these are some of the capabilities they've got and they've acquired, which is significantly different to what we've seen in the Western Pacific um, before. The capacity to blind allied surveillance and reconnaissance systems and disrupt command and control. Uh, heavy preemptive strikes are possible through their tailored missile capabilities in particular. And multiple strikes on naval vessels at sea are possible, uh, et cetera. And, and, and attacks on more, more distant uh, following up supporting infrastructure. And we expect some surprises. And when you think about the situation in the Western Pacific, that the Allies have faced, including obviously the United States, since the Second World War, we, this is significantly different operating environment that we're now going into from what we've faced. We haven't in the past had a situation, but we now do, where we can't say the Allies will necessarily enjoy operational sanctuary in space. We can't say the United States operational bases will be secure. Uh, Allied surface vessel security is not assured in the Western Pacific in a, in a range of crises in the future. Uh, in our view. Uh, Western Pacific airspace will be contested. Um, Allied C4ISR systems will not be inviolable. And in, in for us, in a crisis, uh, the assumptions we have to make about a resupply, particularly from the United States, will be questionable because obviously in a range of contingencies, the United States itself will be under considerable pressure. Then there's a geostrategic switch, as we call it. This is the, the concept that during the Cold War that most of us sort of got our, earned our stripes. In the Cold War, the center of um, global competition was in Central Europe. Well, now it's on our doorstep. That changed a lot. I'm, uh, we, of course, have got a lot of other things going on in the region. India, a good friend of ours, 
of course, is developing uh, a lot of other capabilities, as are others. And I just point out that Russia is, of course, a major Pacific, remind you, it's a major Pacific power as well, and it's boosting some of its capabilities, and not only in Europe, but in this theatre as well. Um, there's this concept of it being a strategic hinge. This is the logic that, if you think about where Australia sits, we are between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, and a big, uh, a big sort of, if you like, uh, staging facility. Um, so for forces coming from one theatre to the other, uh, we see that as a, as, as a very interesting sort of strategic opportunity, especially given that we have very advanced uh, industrial support capabilities and other things of relevance uh, for a major and intensive op operations. Uh, of course, we're seeing also the potential for uh, miscalculation and escalation. Uh, and this, this, in our view, these calculuses have changed significantly in the last 25 years. Uh, and the possibility of um, aggressive behaviour simply getting out of hand, uh, partly by mistake, but also there are elements of strategic instability simply because of the very strong offensive capability uh, you know, that the Chinese have acquired and the way they deploy it. Um, there is, of course, so, some ups, ups, upsides. Some of them, are, this is one of them, an important one. There is potential for greatly enhanced uh, regional partnerships, and we're working on that, as I'll show in a minute. We are, though, seeing also a different United States. And for us, we have to think about that. And here are some of the, the, the things that are changing. Um, um, you can see that there are a lot of you know, distractions for the, for the United States. Uh, we see a less confident American public and less strategic leadership, arguably. Um, I'd argue also a conservative military system, which takes time to move, a lot of time sometimes. And given the changes we're seeing, that's an issue. Um, and there are some legacy base and infrastructure and logistics systems, which in the going into the future era may not be uh, optimal. Um, and we can probably do a lot better together, I think. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of other issues there. Weakened extended deterrence. The nuclear forces in the globe, of course, have changed fundamentally in the last 20 years. And um, the perception of these, of, of, of the, the assurance that the United States has given to its close allies, that if a close ally is attacked um, in, a, in a substantial way, uh, then the United States would regard it as a equivalent to a, an attack on its own territory. How credible is that? How credible is that uh, going forward, given these changes uh, we have seen uh, and we are seeing on an ongoing way in the, in the, in the theatre? Of course, also seeing a, a global diffusion of, of technologies and systems and, in fact, um, really smart operational concepts in everything from organised criminal groups uh, to terrorist groups and so on, and that's a complication. And arguably, we are effectively seeing the emergence of a new global order. And one of the big questions we've been facing is how much can we shape this new global order together uh, as Western allies uh, in, in ways that really suit our interests in the long term. So our, my, our, my draft conclusion so far is this. We face a China ruled by a powerful authoritarian regime using assertive revisionist strategy, uh, and that poses some pretty serious challenges. We're now close to, Australia is now close to centre stage. Um, the rise of other powers and non-state actors is bringing increased complexity. Uh, there's more scope for misperceptions and escalation. There's more, um, we have a less confident the United States. Um, there is a serious weakening of extended deterrence. Regional countries are reviewing their relationships, and there's a new global order. A lot of change, I think you'll agree. So what should we do, and what should countries like us do in the, do in the Western Pacific? And I'm not going to talk about these, but some of the concepts we have talked about at home, and I'm happy to elaborate if anyone's interested uh, in the Q&A period or afterwards. Deterrence, um, a, a defence of Australia, this is really pulling in, if you like, focusing just on our own defence. A more independence posture has been discussed by some. Uh, there's a hedging strategy that's been discussed by some. Partnership and leverage, which is actually more like the sort of thing that um, many of us are, are thinking about. I want to finally, finally just finish by racing through and just li li literally just mentioning. I'm not going to, I'm just really listing 12 practical steps that we're, we've been thinking about and debating amongst ourselves of things we could do in the next uh, five to 10 years. 
Firstly, we could do a lot more. We have extremely good relations into Southeast Asia and the South Pacific in particular, but also further afield. We could do more and build those relationships to build greater, stronger resilience in the region. We could, there of course are these programs already on, on uh, building greater transparency, particularly in the South China Sea. We could actually contribute a lot more to that uh, and, and make, for instance, um, moves that um, people make in the South China Sea almost instantaneously uh, uh, public if we wanted to. Uh, do we want to do that? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, we have a competitive advantages in, uh, because we have large areas, we have highly instrumented advanced exercise and range facilities. We could network these and make them available in new ways to the close allies. One of the problems the United States has got in the rebalance is it's all very well to put more forces forward but it's not much point if you, you can't maintain re readiness with quality exercising and, uh, and other, other facilities being available. We have the capacity to contribute more of that if it's, if it's needed. Frankly, uh, I think it's fair to say Australia and the United States have operated in, in almost every significant conflict where you've been at war since, not, since the First World War. It's hard to imagine almost any situation where we're not going to be operating together. Why is it that we haven't yet put a, a joint strategic planning group together. I think we should. Um, I think we ought to also mesh much more closely in campaign strategies. Um, this means uh, thinking through uh, a range of possibilities uh, which uh, we haven't really done in, in a thorough way um, uh, before. And there are some very interesting possibilities uh, for f which could be very powerful, very powerful uh, in the region in the future. We could establish a Western Pacific Intelligence Hub we already have a lot of advanced facilities and we're getting a lot more capability. We could um, uh, become the Western Pacific, if you like, Allied Space and C4 support uh, um, hub, if you like. Uh, there's, there's, again, a lot more that can be done. And this is a pretty topical one. Uh, we already have the Marines in Darwin, but we could actually provide gr much greater facilities for naval and air assets into Australia uh, if that's required. Two minutes, that's fine. You, you'll have me in one. Uh, we can strengthen cyber and special operations capabilities. Uh, we, can, uh, we actually have been involved with BMD, um, the BMD program uh, for many years, and we have some very advanced te uh, technologies, not least in uh, hypersonic glide and other things. We can do more on that. We have some very advanced industry, uh, m some of which is very relevant to defence, and uh, we could do more of that. Um, and we can strengthen our own capabilities, our own military capabilities, which are already pretty advanced, but they're not huge, uh, to focus more sharply on the things that are going to make a difference in the crises that might, we might face in the next 20 years. So we can do more to, to do that. Here are my draft conclusions. Um, we need to sharpen our focus on the strategic challenges. We need a revised strategy. We need to sustain this current government and its budget in May has boosted defence substantially, and I believe it's going to maintain that. If it's, uh, in that and I think it's pretty well bipartisan, both sides of, of, of government. And we need to strengthen uh, deterrence, uh, and partly by inviting uh, the close allies, particularly the United States, to do more using what we can offer in the theatre. And we need to greatly strengthen regional security partnerships and uh, to enhance their resilience. And frankly, overall, together, uh, I guess the bottom line is, together we've all got to lift our game. Okay, wonder, wonderful job uh, to the panel. I think we've set the table with uh, plenty of interesting and important ideas. Uh, I'll ask uh, people asking questions to please uh, keep their questions brief so we can um, get, and, and maybe to the uh, experts here also to, to keep the responses uh, brief so we can uh, have plenty of questions. I, I would say also comments are welcome as uh, in addition to questions, but let's keep it, let's, let's move along. So. Uh, Yes, sir. Please. Hello, sir. I'm uh, John Hanley, and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Babbage, what are the prospects for Australia conducting uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea? Please. Um, I noticed that um, uh, one or maybe two of uh, the previous speakers said that, you know, it's a good idea to actually do more um, freedom of navigation operations, but don't make a big fuss of them. And I think Tom made that point. Um, let me say something which is actually public, but you wouldn't have seen much in the press. We've been doing it. 
but we've been actually been we've actually for 45 years at least we've been running P3 um, a, a, under a program we call Gateway operations through the South China Sea. We have not changed that, and we've been doing it regularly. Uh, these are not like once every two or three months. Uh, frequently, these are several times a week, um, and just we don't haven't been making a big fuss of it. And the Chinese have certainly noticed it. Um, and in terms of ship movements, we've done a bit of that, um, but we're going to be, I think, doing more. But you may, let me just, uh, we're, we're in, an, in the last uh, three weeks of an election campaign at home, and uh, the government doesn't want uh, to distract from the central messages, which are largely eco eco economic, so it doesn't want to um, uh, do the full suite, not yet. Um, but I think you'll see more um, in the next few months. Yes, sir. Uh, Philip Bilden with the Naval War College Foundation. I also happen to chair the Center for Cyber Conflict Studies Task Force uh, here at the War College. Um, Lyle, I'm going to violate one of your rules here and compliment you all and take some time to do that because this has been, I think, the panel that, that synthesized our most strategic challenges that we face and that the last two days has been trying to address in overlaying the United States strategic challenges in Asia Pacific, along with the cybersecurity challenge in the fifth domain. So my compliments for assembling the subject matter experts that you have here. Um, Dr. Goldman has been a uh, great source of assistance to us at the, at the Naval War College uh, for our, our cybersecurity roundtable forums uh, that have addressed the issues of military doctrine and some of the points that Dr. Goldman outlined in terms of the challenges that we have faced in our U.S. government coming up with uh, not only a military uh, doctrine, but how to uh, bring the cybersecurity framework into our legal and legislative and regulatory frameworks, let alone that of our allies. I would ask the question, since we just had uh, Dr. Babbage talk about uh, one of our allied nations and the strategic framework in Asia, um, I would ask, actually, Dr. Goldman to um, help us think through what, in your personal and unofficial commentary, but as someone who is very senior at NSA and Cyber Command, what is taking place now among our allied nations to preempt the challenges of cyber war? As you note, we, we are on the threshold of that, depending on how we define it, but it is a 24-7 conflict around the globe. And how are we going to, with our, our allies in the Asia Pacific, Australia, Japan, Singapore, Korea, as well as NATO, who only recently this week defined cyber as a fifth distinct domain of battle, how are we going to coordinate these efforts before things go kinetic, if they do go kinetic? Um, so I, I, I think what I would first say is that we are, I mean, in, especially with our Five Eyes partners, we have very strong relationships. We also have very strong, robust relationships on the intelligence side as well. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes um, people can say things in public, but I think we should all feel confident that our partners um, are, um, you know, very closely involved with um, trying to coordinate and develop. I think, I mean, I think we need to figure out a way to um, think of cyber as really coalition based, okay? Because, you know, there's no way that we can, we couldn't do it alone. I mean, it's, it's you know, really a team effort. Um, and certainly we need, um, and we've seen this in sort of recent operations, we need to be able to work with um, not only our interagency partners um, and the private sector too, but our coalition partners that have visibility, that have accesses, that have understanding in the regions of the world that we don't have. So that would be um, one part is, is, is we're continuing to work on them, but um, it, it's, it's still, we're still kind of flying the plane as we build it, so to speak, in terms of the partnerships as well as um, the teams and the capabilities. Um, I think that the other thing I would say is um, the defense. I mean, we're, we're all incredibly vulnerable, okay? And part of that is a function of the way, um, you know, the internet grew up and we rely on these systems. So we need to, I think on the one hand, look at how we become more resilient, but also, which I think was raised in one of the, one of the previous speakers, actually was raised by the, um, the commandant, 
um, we, we have to be able to operate in a degraded environment. We have to be able to say, how are we going to do this if we don't have access to the networks and the systems that we're used to that, you know, actually officers who grew up during the Cold War did not have that, but we have a whole generation of younger officers who take this for granted. Um, so we need to, to train and exercise, expect to operate in a degraded environment, and everybody has to also um, understand that essentially your, your, net, your network, um, your system, is like a weapon system. Um, and that the same way that we have, you know, very clear, you know, guidelines about when you can discharge your weapon, every one of us has to be, you know, very careful that we don't click on something. I mean, spear phishing is still, you know, it's a very low cost way that allows adversaries into the networks and it's incredibly costly to get them out. So this notion of, of the cost curve that it's, very cheap for our adversaries to do this. Um, so, so all of us has to really adopt that culture, and I think that goes with you know our allies and partners as well, because you know we're we're sharing those networks. I don't know, Ross, if you have any additional thoughts on that. From uh, oh, I just uh, reinforce Emily's comment. We're working very closely in these ways. We we are on these bases. And one of one of the biggest issues though we've had, and we've had to work hard, and I know you have too, is that we've had um, very serious problems, uh, which are often not admitted. Uh, of um, cyber attacks and, and penetrations of some of, ma of our major corporations, and some of them got a hell of a fright. Um, um, the good news is that enormous progress has been made in the last three to five years in um, building uh, defence capacities, and we've just put in a whole lot of new facilities in Canberra to coordinate this and do a, a really good job, and also do the links across to um, not just in the national security space, as we, we've been talking about it, um, but in, 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 in countering crime and organised criminal networks and making sure that the legal frameworks allow us to transfer uh, information which we might have gathered in the international security sense, which in the past would have been difficult to provide uh, for, to arrest people domestically. Now we can, we can do that in the way that we've, we've been able to structure that. Lyle, just, uh, if you'll allow me to be the skunk at the party, um, Japan also, uh, in the defence guidelines uh, that were issued last year, um, sort of like the guidance of the force and uh, uh, requirements and so forth for the alliance. Uh, last year included cyber, which is a good thing. But in March in uh, 2011, after the huge tsunami, when PAC fleet um, led um, Operation Tomodachi, which was an impressive operational accomplishment that Japanese taxi drivers still thank me for, um, uh, the reality was that all the comma was done on cell phones and open lines. Um, the Chinese um, cyber capability, uh, if you define it even narrowly, involves tens of thousands. The Japanese um, uh, security officials and so forth who do cyber probably wouldn't fill this room. So uh, the good news is we've identified the problem with our allies. Um, one of the consequences of becoming more joint um, and aligning more closely is that we rely on each other more and these vulnerabilities become even more important. So I think we have a, a, a heck of a lot of work to do with Japan and with Korea where the problem is more about national infrastructure, which of course we rely on for energy, for water. Um, it's, a, it's quite a massive undertaking uh, ahead of us. Yes, sir, in the front row again. Uh, we've heard a lot about the um, possible intentions of China and uh, diplomatic relations and political aspects of the China, South China Sea and what have you. But a couple of questions come up to somebody who was once in the heavy in the steel bending business uh, for the Navy, which is uh, capabilities. We haven't talked about the Chinese capabilities versus uh, uh, the Western capabilities that I, as I see it. And by the way, as an aside, yesterday or the day before when ASEAN broke up, there was great confusion about whether to even bring up the subject of the South China Sea. And I, as I understand it, the four directly involved nations did not bring it up uh, because of trade relations and fear of retaliation and what have you. I don't see that whole group out there as being very solid um, against uh, Chinese aggression. Um, and in fact, I think most of them seem to be co-opted um, <coughs> uh, through trade and uh, fear and what have you, and they'll they'll hold our coats if the United States will stand strong out there. The rest of the countries will uh, cooperate more strongly with us. But at the moment, uh, 
I'm even fearful that if China moved into Taiwan, uh, just as the Soviets, the Russians might move into the Baltic, so I don't see uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, capabilities or intentions or desire on the part of the Western world to, to uh, sacrifice many of their, their young men and women uh, to protect them if the direct allies uh, don't seem to have much, uh, much uh, courage themselves. That's true in Europe, and uh, which is pretty much, uh, NATO has been pretty much defanged, and, uh, and I don't see the Western, the uh, Asian countries after what I saw in ASEAN yesterday before uh, being very strong. And the other issue is uh, there's been no mention here of Chinese capabilities. No one should talk about intentions uh, to the military people. They should talk about... I think, I think we're growing kind of low on time, so okay. maybe let, let's get a response. Mention, let me just one, mention one thing. The Chinese are, are very far advanced on hypersonic, hypersonic weapons and, uh, and also in uh, missile capabilities, especially the, the DF-21, which we, they haven't fully developed, but the RF-28 and what have you. I think we have a lot to fear. Tom, you want to lead uh, off? I just, I just say in um, So the PLA and most open literature says for about 15 years at least in a, in a blue on red, the U.S. is going to win, and, and so they're going to avoid that. Um, and that's also, I think, generally the assessment you hear among our allies. Um, the numbers, you know, people have different ranges, but I think um, that's, that's probably about right. I, th I think we need to focus more on this question of Chinese capabilities in the, in the phase zero uh, arena. And I think em Emily's description of, of the Chinese strategy and effect in phase zero on cyber would apply almost word for word to the um, first island chain, to what the Chinese call the near sea. Um, constant, um, short of violence, um, and degrading our capabilities. Uh, and by the latter, I mean the following. Um, these three artificial islands the Chinese have built are basically three um, uh, Misawa Air Force bases, and I am quite certain that we will see a fourth on Scarborough Shoals, which will give, um, and basically they already have it, we'll give, we'll give, we have this on our website at CSIS, but it will give, if you do their, just draw the range of the J-10 or the SU-27, um, overlocking, uh, overlapping uh, air coverage for the whole South China Sea. Now in phase two, three, that's not a problem for us, but in phase zero, it's a problem. It's a problem, um, by the way, that's in addition to um, the new 10,000 ton Coast Guard cutters that the Chinese are deploying, they're already um, out in sea trials, and the, and the many frigates and destroyers that have been painted white and had the missiles removed, but kept the deck guns that are now Coast Guard. So it's not just armed fishermen, it's, it's PLA Navy uh, with, with different colors. Um, uh, now, again, in, 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 this is a problem for us in phase zero and phase one. Why? Um, we, it, our allies are going to beginning to say, we're going to have to fight our way back into the South China Sea in any scenario with Taiwan or the Senkakus. In 1995 and 96, during the Taiwan Straits crisis, our strategy was to horizontally escalate in the South China Sea because Hainan was vulnerable. Now it's the other way around. So that stretches us. Um, number two, if you're um, the Philippines or if you're Vietnam, you know, this is not just a phase zero problem. This is a phase any time problem, this kind of capability. Um, the Filipinos don't have fighter aircraft. They have two wonderful, my father-in-law served in one, Hamilton class cutters are great boats, but they're not gonna beat the PLA Navy. Um, so this is a serious problem to our allies. And then the third problem is um, that the, deg the degrading that I worry about is the, it's a cliche in China, but the kill the chicken to scare the monkey. If without firing a shot, the Chinese can coerce and change the status quo vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines, um, or Vietnam, um, what do we do? Vietnam's not a treaty ally. The U.S.-Philippine treaty is a little more ambiguous about our responsibilities compared to Japan. I mean, you, you start punching out American credibility up the island chain, and we have a very real problem with the core of our forward presence, Japan. Um, so I think, Emily's your description is actually exactly the same for this maritime area. And those are capabilities where 
you know, shoring up our, our, um, the Philippines to some extent, uh, doing uh, FONOPS, um, working with Australia, where we can start to counter it. But those are the capabilities, in a way, that are most dangerous over the next five years or so. Um, all right, I'll, I'll sign up for that. Um, let me, um, I, I would, for my part, I'm a little less relaxed about the military balance. I think it's, uh, it's very, very troubling, actually. Uh, you might take a look at the uh, RAND report, I believe. Uh, it's called Scorecard. It's, a, it's about 600 pages, so it'll, it'll take you a bit, but it's worth the time. I think it's the, probably the best unclassified uh, study of the military balance in the Western Pacific. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exercise Chairman's prerogative here and pitch the last question, if you don't mind. But it seems to me we have probably the nation's premier Japan specialist and China specialist on this panel. So um, I, I have to ask about this all-important uh, China-Japan-U.S. triangle here. And there, we've had a, uh, quite, a, quite a few weeks here um, between the president's visit to Hiroshima and uh, what's been going on on Okinawa. Um, I wondered if, uh, if uh, both of you might just give your assessment of where we're at in this triangle. Um, and these latest, uh, these latest tribulations. <laughs> well, as I mean, to violate the most basic conference rule and talk about the Donald, but as Donald Trump says, every time Japan and China, fought, fought China fight a war, Japan always wins. So, um, the the economic interdependence between Japan and China is enormous, and both sides know it. Um, there's more Ch Japanese FDI uh, than European or American in aggregate, and. Uh, enormous interdependence. Um, it's, it, it is complicated by nationalism in both countries. The patriotic education campaign in China is just viscerally anti-Japanese, uh, post Tiananmen, and it's intensifying. You can't watch TV in China without eventually coming to a channel where there's an anti-Japanese history drama. Um, Japan's nationalism is, is, is rising. It's 82% um, uh, of Japanese say they don't trust the Chinese. Um, so there's that dimension. Um, but, uh, and, and Abe, I mean, Abe's uh, a bit further to the right than most of the politicians in the diet on some issues, history and so forth. But the idea of um, strengthening the alliance with the US, becoming more joint and interoperable, doing more with India, doing more with Australia, that has pretty broad support in Japan. And I think we'll continue to see that. Um, I think that the Japanese um, had difficulty with the Obama administration at, force, at first. The Obama administration embraced the Chinese proposal for a new model of great power relations, where China is a great power in Asia and Japan and India and Australia are not. It was a very bad idea. Um, I think they've walked away from it. Abe had his own issues that upset the administration with the Yasukuni Shrine. Um, both sides have figured out we got no place to go. And as China's become more and more, um, I can't say expansionist anymore, <laughs> um, uh, possessive of their stuff, <laughs> obstreperous and obnoxious, um, I think the trajectory is going to be uh, a lot closer to US, uh, US Japan cooperation. Tom, you have the. Okay. Yeah.